Selamat siang, Pak Arief. Selamat siang, Pak Daniel. Halo, Ibu Mikaela. Halo Pak Daniel, Bu Mikaela. Hey, how are you? Uh, good, thank you. Is uh, the quality of sound is fluctuating, right? It, it is fine with me. Yet. Fine. The music becomes very loud. <laughs> oh, okay, fine, yeah. <laughs> Voices okay. 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 I'll try to adjust uh, the volume then. I think voices are fine. It just seems to be the music. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. So, how are you all? Oh, good day. How are you? It's good. Okay. Uh. Farif, uh, IPB sejak yeah. uh, kapan IPB jadi IPB University? University? Oh, just uh, baru tahun lalu Pak. Jadi, oh, oke. Okay. Ya, yeah, I guess that actually uh, nama resminya still still Institut Pertanian Bogor in the start of hmm. university, but this is just only for uh, rebranding and promotion, like okay. in like in Wageningen University of Research. They used to be Wageningen Agricultural Research, right? Wageningen Agricultural University. But at the moment, with the decreasing role relatively for the agriculture and also, you know, for the society, uh, their mind, if we are talking about agriculture, it's just only like agronomy and also landscape and so on. It's just only technical matters. But yeah. we do have business school, we do have vocational school, we do have technology and also human ecology of uh, the faculty so that's why actually uh, the facto we are already university but just only for the promotion uh, we are yeah. we call ourselves EPB University hmm. sebenarnya uh, the hindering factor is not only is not institute or Bogor but the terms of agriculture right hmm. yeah I get that Australia also the the faculty of to ensure your microphone is muted throughout the presentation. I would first like to introduce Professor Daniel Prajogo. Daniel is a professor in the Department of Management at Monash Business School at Monash University. He earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Institute Technology Sapola Nope Pemba in Surabaya and a master's degree in quality management from RMIT University in Australia, where he won the best graduate award. He completed his PhD degree in business management from Monash University in 2003. Daniel joined the Department of Management in 2005 as a lecturer, and he is currently serving as the director of research in the department. He has excelled in his time so far at Monash, receiving the Dean's Award for Excellence in Research in 2014 and the Dean's Award for Excellence in Graduate Research Supervision in 2019. Daniel's research is primarily focused on quality, operations, supply chain and innovation management, and he has over 100 publications, including journal articles, conference papers, edited research books, book chapters and industry reports. His research papers have been published in leading journals in their fields. Daniel's was, Daniel was listed as one of the top 25 supply chain management scholars in Asia based on his publications. 
In his research, he has built successful collaborations with a number of industry partners in Australia, including the Joint Accreditation System of Australia and New Zealand, GS1 Australia, Australia Industry Group, Safer Care Victoria and Institute for Safety, Compensation and Recovery Research. Our second speaker will be Dr Arif Darianto. Arif is currently Dean of the College of Vocational Studies at IPB University. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of New England in Australia. Arif has also previously been the Director of the Graduate Program of Management and Business Studies of, uh, of Management and Business, sorry, in the School of Business, IPB University. Arif received his PhD from Un Un University of New England, and he has a long and distinguished history of working on a range of successful ACIAR projects, OKP and EBD Netherlands projects on Roundtable Indonesia, focusing on agricultural policy, poultry, economics of livestock and biosecurity, value chains, and contract farming with smallholders. He is now working with a team from the Netherlands on economics by security and with a team of researchers from the University of Adelaide in Australia on Indonesian dairy and horticulture industry competitiveness. Arif publishes widely on agricultural development issues in Indonesia and supervises numerous PhD and master's students. He has served as a task force member at the Ministry of Agriculture to develop a new long-term agricultural sector development strategy and is currently serving on an experts working group on food security in Indonesia at the Ministry of Agriculture and as a reviewer on cluster and regional core competency programs in the Ministry of Industry. Arif is also very active in various organisations including as chairman of the Forum for Higher Vocational Education in Australia Oh, in Indonesia, I'm sorry, uh, Chairman of the Indonesian Agricultural Economics Association and as Chairman of APMMI, the Indonesian MBA Association. So we have two very distinguished and very expert presenters today. And I would first like to start by welcoming Professor Daniel Projogo, who will discuss lean and global supply chain. Thank you, Michaela, for the introduction. And uh, it's great to meet you all uh, for this uh, very, very uh, special program. It's been a while I haven't done my lecture for Indonesian audience. So today is uh, quite a uh, privilege for me. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity. So I will uh, discuss today about the lean and global supply chain. I will start to give a brief uh, overview uh, because um, I think lean and uh, supply chain is uh, among the buzzwords that many of you should have known. But in case some of you are not very, very clear, so we just need to uh, make sure that we have a similar understanding of the technical definition of these uh, terminologies and uh, lean and global supply chain. And uh, in the second half of my presentation, I will start to look at how to contextualize this lean and global supply chain in the current situation where, you know, everyone in the world is, is currently facing, which is the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how lean and global supply chain have been impacted and what companies can do to mitigate uh, the impact or if not eliminate, at least uh, minimize uh, the impact what companies can do to prepare for the recovery that hopefully will not take uh, too long. So uh, let me start by uh, giving uh, the brief view of what lean philosophy is. Okay, uh, lean is basically as a way of thinking and the way of thinking where we like to produce goods and, and, and products that uh, we want to deliver at a time they're needed and uh, when they're needed. So. We don't want to be too early. We don't want to be too late. We just want to be right at a time and right at the volume that is needed. That's why sometimes lean is called just in time because it was uh, developed back in 1980s uh, or even 1970s at, um, at Toyota's factory. That's why you know, originally some people call it it was a Toyota product system. Now, at the heart of lean philosophy is uh, waste elimination. So, okay, lean is basically uh, want to waste. Now, 
Uh, it's very interesting if you want to understand the word lean. I don't know in, in Indonesia, but in Australia, if you go to a supermarket, if you go to a, a sections uh, where they're uh, selling meat, and you will find that there are some meats there uh, that's called lean. And when 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 the meat is, is labeled as a lean meat, that means that the, the meat has a very little or even no fat. So lean is basically, you know, in in a, in a, uh, consumer world, it's called no fat. And that is not far from what we understand about lean. It's because lean is basically against the fat. And what is the fat in the production is the waste. Now, I'll just give you a very quick, uh, a short, a brief uh, quote from uh, the president of Toyota, uh, Mr. Toyota, who says that waste is anything other than minimum amount of uh, any resources which be absolutely essential to add value to the products. So that is the, the, the idea of lean. Lean means that we only want to use whatever sufficient, okay, the minimum amount of resources to achieve what we call the value adding of the products. Now, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that the lean is, uh, is something against what is called fat. And what is the fat or the waste is the uh, inventory. Now, and that's why uh, lean sometimes is called the pull system rather than the push system. Now, I just want to give you an, an overview of the difference uh, between these two approaches, the pull and the push. With the push system, you try to maximize the utilization of the capacity. So the machine has to keep running at its full capacity. The labor is to work during the working hours. Okay, and that is regardless whether you have a, you have an order or not from the customers. So even if you don't have order, you want to uh, keep your machine working and you keep your your workers working. Why? Because you want to maximize your productivity. So the then at the end, you produce, you know, within eight hours or whatever, you know, amount of hours in, in the one day of production hours, then you produce X amount of uh, products, then you say that, hi, we have 100% productivity. But that is, uh, that's where the problem starts. Because if you produce a product without demand, then your end products end up in inventory. So inventory starts to pile up, even though your uh, productivity is 100%. So what's the use of that? Because finally, you cannot convert your products into cash because you cannot sell the product because there is no demand. So that is what the push system. You try to push your resources to produce the products uh, even though there is no demand. Lean is a very opposite. Lean is called pool system. So there must be a demand first. So you're pulled by the demand. So the amount of books that you do is basically driven by the demand. You just work as many as wanted by the customers. Now, as a result, you have a lower inventory because you will not stock up your products just in case there is a demand but you you have a you have a plan and you know when you produce the products at the end of the day you can deliver to your customers because your demand has triggered your production so that is uh, the difference between these two approaches between push and pull now if you can see this these two model you can see easily that um push product will produce a lot of inventories, whereas a lean approach or pool system, you will have no inventory because you will only order from your suppliers the materials that you need to produce the product that are ordered by your customers. Okay, so that is basically lean. And that's why I want to emphasize here, you know, the, the issue of inventory is one of the uh, primary aspect of lean. I'm not saying here that inventory is the only aspect that Lean is looking at, but when you talk about uh, Lean, inventory is, is one of the one of the uh, targeted issues that Lean tried to attack. Now that is that is a brief overview about Lean. Now when we talk about the companies operating today, uh, we are operating in what is called supply chain, okay, which is the supply, the chain of supply, okay, from uh, suppliers to the manufacturers and then go to the customers again finally end up with the consumer or end user who consume the products so there is no product today that you can find that is built only in one factory from the very raw material until the end product okay and that's why today people call that the competition 
is not between factory against factory, but between supply chain against supply chain. A factory can only be successful as good as the supply chain networks. Okay? Because you need to have a good supplier, you need to have a good distribution uh, networks to make your products uh, delivered and sold to customers you know, at the best level. Now, why supply chain is important? Because um, number one, uh, the companies start to realize that making vertical integration is very costly. So if you're a restaurant, for example, it's, it's very difficult that you have your own restaurant business, but at the same time, you also have to have a farm. You also have to have an arbitrage, okay? Uh, so it's, it's, it's too cumbersome that you have to manage very, very unrelated, diversify the business, okay? So people start to concentrate on what they call core competence. So with that, with that thing, companies can focus their resources to develop what they're best at, the skills and the, the, uh, the value that they're best at, and they start to relinquish the other areas where they are not uh, specialized on. And that's from that idea that comes what is called outsourcing, okay? because people start to, start to release uh, several functions that they don't consider as their core business. Now, at the same time, uh, start to rise uh, what is called specialty producers. Okay, uh, so for example, if you own a bakery, you don't produce, uh, you don't have uh, your farm that produces eggs or baking powder. Okay, you you buy your baking powder from the baking powder factories. Why? Because they produce in a very very high volume. They can achieve what is called economies of scale, so they can they can uh, sell the products in a much cheaper price for every unit of product because they produce in high high volume. Okay, so we just need to purchase uh, whatever we need from these specialty producers and we can maintain our cost effective. The fourth reason why supply chain became important is because the products become more complex and uh, companies do not have all capabilities to make every part on every material that they need to produce. So they have to rely on, on other uh, suppliers who have uh, distinguished uh, capabilities or uh, technical equipments Okay, or even materials to produce the, the components, the products. And finally, uh, with the supply chain, uh, companies start to understand that if they can coordinate a wider spectrum of their supply chain, they can get a better competitive advantage. Okay, I'll get back to, to this uh, issue, the art, the art of integration uh, later on. Now, when we talk about supply chain and we combine supply chain and lean, philosophy. Now we have what is called lean supply chain. And remember, uh, as we talk a few minutes back, the philosophy of lean is we don't want to have any waste. We want the materials to come at the right time so we can produce at the right time and deliver it at the right time to customers. So when we talk about supply chain and we want to, uh, want to apply the lean philosophy in the supply chain, then we have to develop number of ideas or practices. Number one is we must have what is called a view or concentrated suppliers. So we don't have a many supply where every time we change from one supplier to another, okay, it's not just like when we go to supermarket, uh, on one day we go to supermarket A and tomorrow we go to supermarket B. And why we are doing it? Because every week different supermarket have a different catalog sales and we just want to get the products at the cheaper price. Now, that is not a big problem for us because both supermarkets basically selling the same product, exactly the same product, even exactly the same brand. So we just need to choose the cheaper price between the two brands. But when we talk about the components, okay, uh, and some components are so uh, specialized that we cannot have an apple to apple comparison between two different suppliers. So if we, every time we change our suppliers, we always end up with a different specification that we need to adjust in our production as it will become more time consuming and it wastes our time. So Lean suggests that you focus on a few concentrated suppliers and you develop a long-term relationship with them rather than shelter them on the price basis okay, to produce some mutual benefits. And in fact, you will consider the suppliers as the extended family of your company, okay? So it's not just other businesses, but 
it's part of our our extended uh, business. So we have uh, developed a lot of collaborations between the uh, producer and suppliers. And the third the benefit is because you know each other very well, so you will reduce your paperwork and have a very very efficient order processing. Okay, there is not much uh, need to be written in the contract because you know each other very well. And not only that, you do need to inspect the incoming materials even because you know exactly what is produced by your suppliers because you know them very very long time. You know them very very well. And finally, with the long-term relationship with few suppliers, you can have what is called frequent and regular deliveries of small lots materials. Now, this is very important. Rather than your suppliers, you know, delivering a big amount, healthy volumes to you, okay, so they can deliver frequent but small lots. What is the effect? Very, very clear. If they deliver a frequent and regular delivery of small lots of supplies, you don't need to have inventory of raw materials because the material only come when you need it. Okay, so for example, in one week, you need the 700 units. Okay, suppose you, you work seven and seven days a week. Right, if your suppliers uh, send you 700 units on Monday, then you have to keep, you have to use 100 units on Monday, but you have to keep another 600 on your warehouse. Just imagine if your suppliers delivered to you 100 units per day basically you have a zero inventory on your material and that is what lean philosophy is about okay zero inventory uh, that is achieved by long-term relationship of your suppliers now on top of that now we are talking about global supply chain where you know our suppliers are not just our neighbor or you know it's a few uh, kilometers uh, you know next to us but in, well, all over the world so we talk about suppliers, producer, and markets in a different, different places. And why people go to global supply chain? And the reason number one is because they want to expand their market. Okay, especially small countries, their domestic market is saturated very quickly. So they want to expand their market. Number two, they want to they want to have a lower cost of supplier from other parts of the world. Okay, because again, their their country is is very small. There's not enough supplies there. Number three, there is resources, natural resources, and in certain countries, they have resources that you cannot have in your own country. You have to uh, import it from other countries. And number four, of course, that some countries have a much better or more advanced technologies than you have, and that's why you want to uh, purchase from that one. So this is a global supply. And today, it's very, very difficult to find companies, a big company, especially um uh, large company medium the large company that do not have a global supply chain so everything is so good so far okay lean global supply chain works very well until one thing came back in february or january february this year that's called COVID 19 pandemic and the impact is quite severe in many many uh, manufacturing as we know okay started in china but now it's sweep across the world. Okay, what are the, the effects of this uh, COVID-19? Number one, it's the production disruption. Okay, because of the lockdown, the factory cannot operate. Okay, that is one thing, but there are two other impacts. The first one is on the demand side. There is a demand dis disruption because companies cannot sell their products anymore. Okay, the consumer do not buy the products anymore. Okay, number uh, the next one, company cannot deliver their products even though they can make it, but they cannot deliver, even though there is a demand from customer, but they cannot deliver due to the border restriction. And the result is companies can produce a product, but there is no demand, they start to have excess inventory, and they have to stop their production, okay? And they have excess resources, they start to lay off the workers, okay? On the other hand, there is a, at the same time, there could be a supply disruption where companies cannot make the products, because of disruption of material from their suppliers. So they still want to operate. There is still a demand. In fact, there is a lot of demand from the basic product like foods on health products, but due to no suppliers can, can supply their uh, the materials, they also cannot uh, produce the product. So this is where from many, many fronts, uh, COVID-19 has really, really created a severe disruption for the operations. With that, 
people start to think and ponder, is there anything that we need to reconsider of the important or the, the uh, implementation of lean and, and global lean supply chain? There are several lessons that, that, that people start to learn after they start to realize what pandemics actually have done to their operations. Number one, we need to understand the contingency factor of lean. Okay, lean is great, lean is good, lean has been proven effective many, many, many uh, places. Okay, but lean is not uh, is not uh, contextual free. Lean can only work when you have a contextual factors that support its operations. Okay, what are these uh, the assumptions behind? Number one, the works must be regular and repetitive. If when the work start to start to jumble, lean doesn't work. Number two. They must have a stable or at least predictable environment in terms of both demand and supply. When the demand and supply start to be erratic, then uh, you know people start to start to get nervous and lean start to uh, um, being ineffective to handle that uh, changes, uh, sudden changes. And number three, lean offer a very limited uh, flexibility, and, and therefore when the change becomes so drastic, like in the in the event of pandemic then uh, lean becomes ineffective okay and number two uh people start to reassess inventory as i mentioned earlier lean is against inventory but with uh the disruption of supply people start to look at the risk of having zero inventory because people start to we start to start to understand that we need a buffer we need an insurance just in case something happens so we cannot eliminate inventory completely perhaps okay because we are not ready if something happened to us like this okay so that's uh, that's lesson number one lesson number two is people start to understand about risk and resilience so they start to, to to start to balance between pool system which i explained earlier which is a responsive to demand with the predictive analysis so we cannot simply wait until the demand comes from customer. We must be able to predict what might happen with the demand so we can be prepared, be prepared on it. Okay. Number two, we need to impact, uh, we need to assess the impact of the changes that happened to us. Okay, what happened to us uh, to what and with aspect of the operations uh, will be impacted, whether it is the supply, the operations, or the demand side. Okay. And number three is uh, we need to consider, okay, uh, not only just in time, but also just in case. Uh, if you know, wherever you buy insurance, I don't know, you know, many of you in Indonesia, you have an insurance here in Australia, you know, we have a car insurance, we have a home insurance, we have a health insurance, we have a job insurance, okay, uh, everything is to be insured. And the spirit of insurance is just in case, because we cannot predict what might happen and should something wrong happen, we know how to handle it. The insurance will start to take place. That is what we need to understand about risk management. Number two is uh, emergency plan. We need to, uh, business starts to understand the business continuity plan during the emergency time, okay? And this is very important that we need to look at the flexible operations, how we can uh, still operate in an in abnormal condition. Can we change our operation? Can we change uh, the setting of our machine? Can we change our products or even materials so we still can produce the products even though it's not as, uh, as the same condition as we produce during normal condition, but we still can produce the product and supply to our customers. Now, in, in saying that, then we need to have a flexibility in our contract with customer and suppliers because we cannot produce the same quality because uh, the, the same material is not available, okay? We cannot deliver on time. We need extension and scheduling or delivery and also the price because now the scarcity of material start to uh, have an effect in our, in our supplies. We need to negotiate the customers to, be, to prepare in our contracts with our customers in our suppliers what happened during the emergency plan. Okay, and of course, number three is the recovery plan. Uh, we need to understand what happened after the massive changes, what happened after COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, 
we never know when when it will it will end but hopefully it will end one day <laughs> you know uh, we're not too long but then many many people say that we will not go back to normal we will start to enter what is called new normal so the recovery actually preparing us for the new normal now the the third uh, the third lessons is about supply business network okay Number one, we need to understand who are our supplier. We need to look at uh, who are our supplier and our supplier suppliers. We need to understand who is our customer and our customer customer. Okay, the, the better we have a visibility of our supply chain network, the more we can understand and the more we can uh, be ready should something happen in our supply chain network. Number two, we need to balance the concentration between our suppliers and diversification. Okay, uh, rather than have one large suppliers, perhaps we need, need, need start to look at you know smaller volume with more suppliers. Okay, geographically, so should something happen in one part of the world, we still can continue to supply from the other part. So start to spread the risk rather than concentrate it on uh, on one or few uh, suppliers. And the last one is we need to balance between globalization and regionalization. Okay. Um, again, uh, there is a lot of uh, advantages of globalization, but you know, should something happen like uh, COVID-19, then people who actually uh, have a, their supply base regionalized, actually they are not so impacted compared to those who have a purely global supply chain. Now. Before I hand it over to Pari, just want to give a one last note. When we talk about global global lean supply chain, when we talk about the food, which Pari will will uh, elaborate more, there are several things that are more. I think it's more critical or more difficult or more complicated than just uh, other consumer products like clothing or footwear. Why? Because uh, food supply chain basically is a, is a basic need. Okay, we need to eat. Okay, we need food more than any other needs. Again, number two, a food has a short shelf life. So there is an inventory problem there. You get food, certain foods, uh, vegetable, dairy foods cannot be kept too long. So the supply chain become very, very important there. How to uh, make a smooth and quick, swift uh, speed of uh, material flow uh, in the supply chain. Number three, uh, geographical specific okay uh, certain areas can produce different food compared to other areas so that's why again a global supply chain and the food is also uh, very very pertinent number four there's a seasonal supply and imbalance supply and demand so the the food products some fruits okay vegetables cannot be produced the whole year they have a seasonal and that's why they have a seasonal supplies even though the demand is constant throughout it. How to balance this is another challenge. And then uh, many uh, food supply chain have a long chain and of intermediaries uh, uh, between farm and two plate. And because it's a long chain, there's a lot of loss and waste in food supply chain. So um, I hope uh, you can get um, an overview of the challenge of uh, global uh, supply chain and how lean who has been proven as being so effective in the last 30 years, and people start to reconsider how we implement lean in a forward thinking, okay, considering that it's been, it's been hit uh, severely by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll return to uh, uh, Michaela for uh, leading to the next session. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'll just remind you that if you have any questions, please post them to the Q&A board and we will answer them at the end of the, the session. Uh, I would now like to pass on to uh, Dr. Arif and he will be presenting to you on food security and resilience. Okay. Uh, terima kasih.
Is it okay, Bu Michael? Hello? Yep, perfect. We can see it. Ah, okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Terima kasih, uh, Ibu Michaela. Thank you uh, for the opportunity that has uh, given to me. And in this session, I would like to set a perspective on food security and resilience, a crucial topic not only for developing countries, but also for developed countries. And let me start uh, this lecture with an introductory quote from uh, Dr. Josette Siran, with Food Program Executive Director, uh, stating that managing and rural access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life is one of the greatest challenges that society faces today on a global scale. Indeed, uh, the importance of food security has become paramount during the COVID-19 pandemic. Food security is being widely discussed as a further concerning consequences of the increasingly widespread impact of COVID-19 pandemic, as Pak Daniel explained earlier, rising employment, unemployment among formal and informal workers is leading to declining purchasing power, subsequently increasing the risk of food insecurity and malnutrition in food uh, security issues in developing countries and also developed countries in the medium and the long term. The majority of the poor in the bottom of 40% population are employed in the informal sector and in sectors estimated to be highly too moderately impacted by the pandemic. There has been an indication of household reducing consumption to the COVID-19 social distancing measures, including restriction on movement and business uh, operation. Okay. Why is stuck? Okay, now why uh, security, why food security and why it matters? Uh, let's uh, go back to the noise to the notion the importance of food security and why it always matters based on this well accepted definition from fao food and agriculture organization back in 1996 uh, food security is achieved when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious food uh, to uh, meet dietary uh, need and food preference for an active and healthy life. Five pillars of food security, availability, accessibility, acceptability, adequacy, and also stability. So for a state of food security to exist, all of these four components or five components must be sufficiently pre uh, present. Well, I guess the, for example, challenge uh, persists. A uh, challenge uh, persists among all of uh, five components of food security, not only for developing countries, but also in developed countries. Uh, for example, what is the affability? The five components of food security, one of them is affability. Uh, the affability means sufficient supply of food for all people uh, at all times. Then for the accessibility, means physical and economic access to food at all time. This has also uh, been taken uh, to describe equality of access to food and accessibility, access to culturally acceptable food with its produce and obtain uh, ways that do not uh, compromise uh, people dignity, uh, self-respect or uh, human right. Then another two, adequacy and also stabilities explanation is access to food that is nutritious, safe, and produced in environmentally sustainable ways, and stability is uh, reliability of food supply. Uh, back to uh, the first one, the pillar number one, availabilities. Issues for developed countries, for example, supply to remote communities. The second one is rising dependence on imported foods. How the supply chains, lean supply chains challenge introduced by but David Elias, how to guarantee uh, the supply to remote communities, how to guarantee the rising demands of uh, imported uh, foods, how the global value chain is working in that case. And 
for the issues for developing countries, uh, we can see that rapid uh, population growth is one of uh, the main issues in developing countries. And then also, you know, the uh, failures of uh, the crop failures, like what Daniel said, that the agriculture sector is also pulls uh, from the external uh, challenge or external shocks, depleted uh, uh, food uh, reserve, for example. And for the accessibility, for example, in developing countries, we are dealing with cost of food imports, endemic poverty, food transport and storage uh, infrastructure. While in developed countries, we are dealing with this advantage group, some indigenous population and some people in institution, then also poverty, cost of promotion of nutritious food relative uh, to junk food. In the case of accessibility, the third pillar uh, in developing countries, the issue are animal production methods, reliance on aid programs, then also cultural restriction on particular food, but in acceptability issues in developed countries is concern about sources of some imported food and so on. Then if we have a look further for the uh, for the fourth uh, component, adequacy issues in developing countries, for example, pure dietary balance. Uh, at the moment, uh, in Indonesia, for example, we do have triple burden of malnutrition, uh, stunting, wasting, and also micronutrient deficiency and also obesity, and then relan uh, reliance on imbalanced diet, nutritional deficiency, and so on. And the fifth stability, uh, we are dealing in developing countries, scarcity, scarcity of water and arable land, and then adverse uh, climate events and also conflict and post-conflict variation in global food reserve reliance on aid program and food transport and storage uh, infrastructure. We need to uh, develop more and better uh, quality of infrastructure and also quantity in developing countries. Then for uh, the global food security index, how to measure uh, the, uh, the food uh, security index? We do have some measure actually. Uh, one of them is global uh, food security index. We do have also the rice bowl index also for uh, Asia. Uh, the uh, the the global uh, food security index here uh, is published uh, by EIU, uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, and uh, collaborated uh, with uh, Dupong uh, Company. So, what is the global food security index here? Is a comprehensive uh, assessment of the state of global food security. The index looks uh, beyond measuring hunger alone to underline factors driving food insecurity across three internationally, internationally established dimensions. First is affordability. Do people have sufficient economic access to food? Availability. Do people have sufficient physical access to food? Quality and safety are people, nutritional and dietary needs uh, being met to ensure an active and healthy life. And additional layers, uh, the previous one is just only three, but now there is an additional measures uh, indicator. Uh, we call it uh, the natural resources and resilient ranking. Uh, so how climate related and natural resources risk can push a threat global food security. The rankings show how resilient is food system in the face of climate and natural uh, resource race. Food systems are highly susceptible to the impact of climate change and natural resources risk. Uh, this risk include exposure, water, land, ocean, demographic stresses, adaptive capacity, and also uh, sensitivity. So here the table explaining about the country level of food uh, security. Indonesia was ranked fifth in Southeast uh, Asia and 62 rank in the world on the Economist Intelligent Unit uh, Food Security Index. Uh, the country uh, score an overall 62.6 out of 100 point, lower than 62.9 average among 113 country and territories 
compared to the Southeast Asia peers, Indonesia was behind Singapore. Singapore is first place. Malaysia is 28th rank and Thailand uh, places in the 52 and Vietnam is 54, though ranking above the Philippines 64 and Myanmar 77, Cambodia 90th and Laos 92. I think that uh, our audience probably asking, where is uh, Australia? Australia, where is Australia there, the Australia? Oh, I think it's in the, oh, there is Australia in the, uh, the, the fourth uh, line on the table. Australia is one of the most secure country in the world for several reasons. Australia produce more food than it consumes, exporting around 70% of agricultural production. Australia do not produce everything they like to eat, however, and imports account for around just only 11% of food consumption by values. Australia ranks among the most uh, food uh, secure nation in the world, alongside uh, Canada and also Germany and France. Australia is high income country, ranking 12th uh, in the world for per capita income, and the vast majority of Australia can purchase basic food stuff that provide adequate uh, nutrition. Australia benefit from being able to choose from an enormous and growing number of food products sourced from all, for, from all over the world at affordable prices and also can access diverse and highly quality food regardless of seasonal condition or changes in the world prices. So I think that uh, the lecture of uh, the lean uh, supply chain, I guess, also contributing uh, this uh, high position of Australia in the global uh, food security index. When, uh, why, why the food security matters uh, in Indonesia or in Australia or also in the world? We do have here that uh, the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report released uh, last uh, January. For this year report, more than 750 experts and decision makers were asked to rank their biggest concern in terms of likelihood and impact. For the first time in the survey, 10-year outlook, the top five global risks in terms of likelihood were all environmental, with extreme weather event, human-made environmental damage and disaster, and, ma and major diversity loss, the biodiversity loss and natural disasters from a quake to tsunami, all the likely risks in 2020. In terms of the severity of impact, uh, over the next 10 years, the top risk was deemed to be the failure of climate change mitigation and also adaptation. So that's why in terms of uh, food resilience is becoming more uh, important. And why the food security is very important for, for Indonesia, for example, that although self-sufficiency uh, in some commodity is already occurring to Indonesia, but the contribution of uh, uh, import uh, still uh, you know, big uh, amount of uh, uh, volume and also value uh, to be spent by Indonesia to buy uh, some uh, important uh, commodity uh, to uh, Indonesia. And well, uh, other things that why food security matters, why it matters, if we related to sustainable development goals, uh, the relation between food security and sustainable development goals, yeah, over half of SDG related to food security and nutrition. So if we are managing well food security and nutrition, I guess the overall half of sustainable development goals yeah, will be achieved. The adoption of the sustainable development goals by United Nations in 2015 led to wide recognition of a paramount importance of agricultural sector in ensuring socioeconomic progress it is currently the world leading employers and plays a vital role in the livelihood of 40 percent of the population agriculture is obviously the main focus uh, of goal two with aim to achieve zero hunger and also goal one uh, no poverty but the agriculture sector is still also involved to different extent uh, for example to uh, goals 12 uh, in, uh, in responsible consumption and production goals 13 
uh, climate action and 14 and 15 related to conserving aquatic and also terrestrial life. Agriculture is also focus of goal five, which is uh, geared towards promoting women rights uh, to land ownership in the 2034 sustainable development agenda to achieve the sustainable uh, development goals. And then uh, why it also matters the food security because uh, in the future, the new, fit, the, the new food system will be uh, what you call, I mean that we, we will have a new food system uh, which have characteristic of uh, efficient, inclusive, climate smart, sustainability, nutrition and health driven, and also uh, business uh, friendly. Okay, well, uh, the next. is about uh, the definition of uh, uh, resilience. There are so many uh, definition of uh, resilience uh, in uh, in the literature, but I just pick up uh, three uh, definition of uh, resilience. Here, the first one is from Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The second one from Food Security Information uh, Networks, Reliance uh, Measurement Technical Working Groups, and also the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO 2016. So I just uh, only focus more on the Food and Agriculture Organization definitions. The definition of resilience is the ability uh, to prevent disasters and crises, as well as to anticipate, absorb, accommodate, or recover from uh, them in timely, efficient, and also sustainable manner. So uh, another uh, definition is uh, came from Intergovernmental Planning on Climate Change (IPCC) uh, 2015. Uh, definition of resilience is the ability of a system and its component uh, parts to anticipate, absorb accommodate or recover from the effect of hazardous uh, event in a timely and also efficient manner, including through ensuring the preservation, restoration, or improvement of its essential basic structure and also function. So I guess that if the COVID-19 can be productive very well, I guess that the lean uh, supply chain and also the food security is also can be managed uh, a bit uh, easier, but the, the COVID-19 come uh, tiba-tiba or, uh, or in Bahasa Javanese, uh, Pak Daniel say ujuk-ujuk, tiba-tiba. Yeah? Uh, you know? so, so everybody is also shocked uh, about that. Okay, well, uh, how about the, uh, the food system drive uh, and feedback uh, here? Uh, we, we see that in the uh, in the food resilience, we can also use uh, another framework here. Uh, what we call it is uh, using uh, food uh, system drivers and feedback. In the food system, we can we can say that a food system is an assemblage of a number of different uh, activities undertaken by a range of different actors as influenced by a variety of drivers which give rise to a set of outcomes. Uh, Daniel just uh, say about the supply chains uh, from you know, uh, the process uh, production, processing, distribution, retail that may be involved before food reaches uh, our plates, supply chain operate of food global and also uh, local level. How supply chains uh, to be optimal, you utilize the principle of uh, economic of scale, economics of scope and also agglomeration methods, as Daniel explained, is really very good uh, related to the supply chain optimalities. And also supply uh, chain is also very important. For example, here from the diagram, we can see from farm to table, uh, processing, packaging, sourcing, and also market, uh, and also 